Well, welcome to the first Sunday of a new year. Don't you love new? I love new. I love the smell of new, you know, and the possibilities and, uh, of new. I, I just love it. And a lot of times, you know, as we begin a year, we have set some goals uh, for, our, for our lives, right? Uh, and and I, I set goals for myself last year, and I want to tell you about one of those goals that I, that I actually completed all of last year. I determined that I was going to be the master and the commander <laughs> of the toilet paper dispenser roll <laughs> at our house. If it was empty, I was going to fill it. If it was sitting on top, I was going to put it on the roll. If it was in the basket next to her, there wasn't anything wrong, I was going to help out. And it's the little things. It's the little things in life. If you've ever gotten a call on your cell phone from your spouse that says, help, I'm stranded, you will understand. It's the small things in life that go a long ways. But it's the serious things that cause us to set goals for our lives. Sometimes, sometimes they are, they are goals that we set because we feel a sense, a, a calling for change. Change in our life is necessary and we know it. We know it. And sometimes it's a change in the area of finances. Sometimes it has to do with relationships. Um, sometimes it has to do with health. But today, it's about spiritual change. It's about an aching for the things of God and the possibilities of what God can do in, in our lives. The way the, the way the Bible puts it is in the language of a new song. Need a new song. And we could actually leave here with a new song or know that a new song is coming to our lives. We need a new song. For instance, one of my favorite um, psalms is Psalm 40, verses 1 through 3. And it, is, it talks about a new song that comes in a time of desperation and misery. The, the, the psalmist writes that, that uh, he was in a deep, dark, slimy, muddy pit in life. He was stuck. He was stuck in that pit. And he cried out to the Lord. And the Lord heard his cry, and at some point in time, because he waited patiently, the Lord came and he says, and he lifted me out of the pit, put my feet on solid ground, and he put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to my God. And everyone was amazed. We need a new song in times of misery. Sometimes it's not about misery. Sometimes it is just about coming to a place in your life where you need a new perspective, where you need a new challenge. It's, it's almost like where the deeper things, the Spirit is calling us to the deeper things of God. It's like Psalm 98 verse 1 that says to us, it says, come before the Lord with a new song and the reason is for he has been, he has done great and mighty and awesome things. So it's calling us to, to sing, to get a new perspective, and to look to him in that time. What I want you to know is that God wants us to have a new song and to sing a new song to sing a new song as a church, to sing a new song as individuals. He wants that. Now I want to tell you about the power, the power of, of song. You know, I, was, uh, I just finished my freshman year uh, as a college student uh, up in Abilene, Texas, and 
I was lonely for home in Alabama. I was missing my mama. I was missing my mama. I was missing her cooking. Man, I was lonely for home. And so when the summer came along, I took a few weeks and I got in my Dodge Rally Sport pick em up truck and I headed out. I was going to make a one way, I mean, a one day trip. And, you know, getting, getting out of Texas is half the trip. You ever notice that? Just getting out of Texas. And I got out of Texas and drove across Louisiana and then drove across Mississippi. And I knew that the Alabama state line was coming up. And so I clicked on my AM radio because FM didn't come standard in those days. And I hit the, the tune, tune in button and it went to a local station. And I kid you not, at the very moment that I was crossing the state line, Leonard Skinner <laughs> began to sing Sweet Home Alabama. And that signature, bang, 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 you want to sing it, I know. Bang, break forth in song, you know. And, and I'm going to tell you, my heart just nearly leapt out. I know people were driving by and they said, give a wide space around. He has gone nuts. The power of song. But what we need today is the Lord's song. We need a new song. We need the, the Lord's song for, for our lives. And the reason is, sometimes it's because we just mess up. Sometimes we burn bridges. We've done things that sometimes we, you know, we've broken relationships or we've messed up things in our own life or those around us. Sometimes things come into our lives. We need the Lord's song. And sometimes we do hear the Lord calling us to deeper maturity in Him calling upon us to come to Him and to know Him and to sing His song. Well, when we come to our Bible passage today in the book of Revelation, the last, the last book of the Bible. Uh, we find a man who gets caught up in a new song, in the Lord's song. Let me give you a little, little background before we look at our verses. John, is the apostle, has been exiled to the island of Patmos. He is there because he is a Christian leader. He is exiled by the anti-Christian Roman government. And he's placed on basically the, an island that was, shouldn't be an habitable by human beings. It was difficult and rocky terrain and the, the, the weather was challenging and, and there's limited resources on that island. If in every way we could describe it, it was a miserable place. It was miserable. It was difficult. But it's in that place of misery that God speaks to John. John. John receives a vision that produces this book, the book of Revelation. And when we come to chapter 5, we are told that John is, is ushered up into the, into the heavenly throne room, into the court of God in a vision. He's, he's drawn up before the Lord in a vision. And, and there, caught up in the, amidst the, the brilliance uh, and the beauty of the throne room and the throne of God, with the presence of angels and the 24 elders, we're told that John's attention was turned to focus on a scroll that was held in the right hand of he who sat on the throne. And then the, the voice of a mighty angel asked the question of this scroll that had seven seals 
wrapped around it to say it was completely wrapped up. The mighty angel of the Lord asked the question, who is worthy to, uh, to, to unclasp and to read and open the scroll? And the angel says, there is no one. No one among the angels. There is no one among men. There's no one on the earth, no one under the earth who is able to open the scroll. And we're told that when John, in the vision, hears this, he's overwhelmed and he begins to weep. And it says he weeps deeply and continually. The reason why John is weeping is because this scroll that no one can open apparently contains the mystery of God's redemptive plan, of the end of all things, and of the ultimate victory of God. And he's weeping because it can't be opened. And then one of the elders comes to John and says, stop weeping. Someone has come who can, who is worthy. It is the Lion of Judah, of the tribe of Judah. It is the one of the root of David. He is victorious. And we come to verse 6. When we come to verse 6, it is as though John now, he stops weeping, and it's as though he turns, he turns, and I'm, I'm sure in his mind he thinks he's going to see a lion, the lion of Judah. But to his surprise, as he, as he looks, it's not a lion, it's a little lamb. A little lamb. And though it is alive, it looks as though it has been slain. It, it, it shows all of, the, all of the markings of sacrifice. It has been slain. It is the perfect Lamb of God that was offered. And, and he is worthy, we are told. Uh, and, and so he turns and he sees this Lamb of God in front of him. And, and the, uh, the elders bow down, kneel down before him. They have with them their instruments of worship, the harps that they have, their stringed instruments to worship Him. And they hold in their hands the, the, these golden bowls of incense that we are, told, we are told that contain the prayers of the saints. Which tells us that God never forgets our prayers. And it may very well be that these are the prayers of the saints that are, that are pleading for that one to come. And when John sees the lamb that was slain, he understands this is God's redemptive plan. That God is, is not going to force people to love Him. That God is not going to come into the world and pressure people and with His authority and might make people be obedient to Him. But the way that God would win the world is through sacrifice and through service, through love. We know that not everybody will respond to that. But this is God's redemptive plan to win the world through love, through sacrifice, 
through service. And it says that as they bowed before him, they began to sing a new song. Now pick it up with verse 9. Now you, I want you to see verse 9. Go to that next slide. I want you to see verse 9 and 10. This is our text. I want you to follow the words as I, as I read them out loud. And they sang a new song. This is not the second stanza of an old miserable song. This is a new song. They sang a new song. And notice the words of this new song. You are worthy. 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 I guess that would be the contemporary version. <laughs> You're worthy over and over. I, I have a hard time getting past it. You're worthy. You're worthy to take the scroll and to open its seal because you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased men for, for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. That's us. And you made them to be a kingdom of priests to serve our God. And they will reign on earth. That's the new song. I, I highlighted, underlined some key words that are in this song. Key elements of this song. One is the word slain. We're talking about Jesus we're talking about Jesus who, who faced the cross, who consciously went to the cross and gave his life. We were singing a moment ago about the, the beyond the cross, that he rose from the dead, but he bears on his body the marks of the slain lamb. He was slain. And then purchased. It says, and with your blood, you purchased. Purchased people from every walk of life, from every nation, from all peoples, from every language and tribe. You, you made it possible. Purchased through the blood of the Lamb. You know, I, I, I grew up in a country church and we'd sing that song, song, What can wash away my sin? And the people said, Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And it may be unnerving to somebody when we say, I've been covered in the blood of Christ. Well, we, we, we mean that in reference to, to this kind of verse in the Bible. Covered, saved, His life, His blood, drained as a sacrifice. He paid the price. He paid the ransom. And the word for purchased talks about people that are brought up to be auctioned off. They were captured in war. They, are, they were people that uh, couldn't pay their bills. They're being sold off into some service. They were like us, that we, we're caught in sin. We, we're owned by it. With his blood, he paid the price for us. And then made. That word is full of possibilities. And made. It, it's intentional. And made them to be a kingdom. We are a a new kingdom. We are Christ's people. And to be priests. Priests. Um, to serve our God. We're, we're, we're different. We're set apart. That's what he did. To reign. To reign with victory. His victory. What do we do with, what do we do with this? I don't know, this is what came to mind. 
I, I want to suggest, maybe for us as a church, but I'm thinking for you, take some time. Write in your own words. Maybe your hopes for us as a congregation. In your own words, a new song. For your life. A song that will define Christ's life and you and us and the possibilities of your life in Him and of our lives in Him. You say, now preacher, I'm not a, I'm not a singer. I promise you, you're singing something. Some of us are singing gloom, despair, and agony on me, and for good reason. But how about letting His Spirit work through our hearts to write out a new song? And what would, what would that new song, what would it include? It'd have to include, for some, repentance. A turning around. A breaking free from the chains that hold. Repentance and forgiveness. Maybe include renewal. Revival. How many of us need a fresh touch from the Lord? We need revival. We need it. We're often dry like those dead bones that Ezekiel talk about. We need the fresh move of the Spirit of the living God in our lives. Sing that song. Come, Lord, into my tried up soul. It would have to be a song that would include surrender and submission. That's the Lord's song. Your way, not mine. It would have to be a, it'd have to be a song that would include words of possibilities. We are made to be a kingdom of Christ, to be priests. But you know what that word is echo, echoing back to, priests? It's how, how, he, how God planned to win the world. His redemptive plan is also His redemptive plan through us to sacrifice and to serve. To show the love of God and to live unleashing the power of God in our lives and in our community. That's what the song is about. That's why He gave His life. That's what happens when we're saved. A dear friend of mine told this story. Friend, a pastor friend up in West Texas told this story that many years ago, a group of men in his church went to Uganda. It was a short time after that, that terrible, um, destructive dictator, Idi Amin, had been removed. A dictator who basically was destroying and killing and murdering his own people. And often he would go into these villages, his troops would go in and they would, they would take these children from these villages and they would force them to fight. They give them weapons of war and face, force them to fight. Well, these men go on this mission trip after all of that and they go into this particular area where they, where they have a home for many of these displaced children. And as they go in there, they, they discover that these children are bearing the scars of war, the wounds upon their body and many in their hearts. And the men, over a period of time, teach Bible study. And, and on one particular day, they were teaching a lesson out of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. 
that said, one of these days, there's going to be a shout of the mighty angel, the archangel, and a trumpet blast, and then the Lord will return. He's going to make all things right. But one of the little boys asked, what will the mighty angel shout? You know, they began to talk about that. What would, they, what would the angel shout? They talked about it. Finally, one of the little boys that was at the very back bore the scars of war on his face. Said, I know, I know what he will shout. Said, what will he shout? He will shout, enough. 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 